Give us a some of page somebody. Ninety seven.
first one in the blue book.
Master, Brother Tommy leads to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you so much. I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this showing up today, Lord. But it's loud and loud when your Holy Spirit gets this church service, Lord. And we just want to thank you for it. We want to lift up all these prayer requests again, Lord, and especially on a special day. Lord, be with them. Lord, but we just want you to be with this church service, Lord. We just want you to give the words of command to preach you today, Lord. And also, Lord, if there's anybody that needs to say something or do something, today, just let them do it, Lord. Let's start a revival in our own hearts. I know your angels draw your wounds at the end of 
Thank you, Brother David. Thank you, choir. Thank you for playing for us this morning. I, I need to also say thank you to Matt. I've been on Matt a little bit for not playing the guitar, so when you got up there and Matt went and joined, I was all tickled to death because I thought, man, this, we're back, right? I mean, that's exactly what I was saying. I want you to know this morning, our passage is found in Luke chapter 8. As you came into church this morning, I bet you came in with this thought in mind. What's going to happen today? Right? Now, you may not have realized that was your thought, but that was your thought. You came into church, you looked around, and you thought, what's going to happen today? Maybe it wasn't about here at church. Maybe it was after church. What's going to happen today? Somewhere along the way this morning, you've asked yourself, what's going to happen today? What have I got planned? What's out there? What's going to be laid out before me? Have I got plans for lunch? Have I got plans for dinner? Have I, have I got plans for while we're at church? But somewhere along the way, you have thought this morning, what is going to happen today? You know how I know that? Everybody in the church put on something, right? You put on whatever outfit you put on based on what you're thinking. I'm going to be doing something today. I'm going to church. And so you put on your clothes, and you came to church. 
And so this morning, I want you to know that as you've come to this place, you may have come with the crowd, being a part of the crowd, not realizing that God has already called you out personally, has already addressed you personally, and has a plan for you personally this morning. And I'm going to show you why I believe that. And I'm going to ask you as we look at God's Word and as we study together that you prepare your heart even now. God, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm going to do. Oh, how sad it is. Many times we come to church and we are, are ready to respond. We're ready to do. But for whatever reason, we either get distracted or we get frustrated or maybe we get, uh, uh, get on our hearts and on our minds something else. And, and we tend to forget to do what God wants us to do. Or maybe there's the fear that creeps in. Or maybe there's a, and you can fill in the blank on why it is that we don't do what God tells us to do. But this morning, I'm going to give you this promise that if you're willing, to listen to God, if you're willing to be sensitive to the heart, if you're willing to do and obey whatever God lays upon you to do, I'm here to tell you this morning, you will leave this place saying within your heart, maybe even saying out loud with your voice, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord and I have been blessed. But if you live here this morning and you're not obedient, if you leave here this morning and you close yourself off from God, you're going to leave here this morning thinking to myself, why did I even go? Oh, I hope and pray that that's not how you leave this morning. What an exciting time as we've sung, as we've heard uh, uh, Brother David sing. Uh, by the way, I just want to pause. I'm going to chase that other rabbit. I, I like the fact that you let me chase a few. This is one of them. I'm going to chase this rabbit. Aren't you glad to know that I get to put on a new body? I get to put on the new robe? It's Jesus that sits there with all the scars and all the, all the mess and all the hurt. He's the one that has bore my burden. And I get to stand there in pristine white in front of God. Because He loves me so much that He saw fit to give me a new body, a new robe. This morning, if you're here and you're lost, I want you to know that the only way to receive that new body and that new robe is confess your sins to Jesus, ask Him to forgive you of your sins, and save you today. Oh, I pray that you will. Let's, let's stand together as we look and as we read in Luke chapter 8. We're going to begin reading with verse 40. And, and follow along if you would. Luke, uh, Luke 8, verse 40, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received Him, and they were all waiting for Him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one, uh, one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a-dying, but as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Brother Johnny, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Amen, and you may be seated. Let's play this scene out for just a moment. Let's make sure that we've got this just right. Here is Jesus. He's coming back in, and the people are all excited that Jesus has come back, and so they're getting ready to just have this celebration. Everybody's gathering around. Everybody is excited that Jesus is there. 
And in the midst of this, there is a guy by the name of Jairus who literally bows down at Jesus' feet and looks at Jesus and says, I need you to come to my house. I've got one daughter, only one. She's 12 years old and she's about to die. She's literally on her deathbed. And Jesus, if you'll come, she will be healed. Jesus, if you'll come, I know that everything will be fine. Jesus, I need you to come and take care of my daughter. Now, right off the bat, you automatically have the sense of urgency of Jesus needing to leave this place to go to this man's house to see this young girl to help heal her and bring her literally back to life, if you would. Twelve years of age, only daughter, this man's begging and pleading for Jesus to come, right? Pretty important time, pretty important moment, pretty important event. Jesus needs to get there. And so he begins to go to his house and all these people come and they gather around him. Man, they're pressed up against him to the point that literally, I mean, they're just almost pushing and shoving. You can almost picture the scene, the big crowd. If you've ever been to a huge ball game and as you've left, you know that sense of, of being in that crowd and being packed in trying to make your way to get to wherever it is you're trying to go. And so here's this scene I'm, uh, playing out and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this lady sneaks up and she grabs hold of Jesus' garment right by the hem. Just reaches out and touches Jesus' garment. Now, I want you to think this through with me. There's tons of people, tons of pushing and shoving, tons of chaos. Jesus has a purpose. Jesus is going in a direction. He's got a need. It's an emergency. And this woman reaches out and touches him and Jesus stops. He says, wait a minute, somebody touched me. Now I want you to think what his disciples must have been thinking. He has lost his mind. Of course people have touched him. They've touched him the whole way through. That's all that these people are doing. They're pushing, they're shoving, they're trying to get to him. They're trying to get his attention. Of course he's been touched. She says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just the casual rubbing of shoulders. I'm talking about somebody in faith has reached out and touched me because I feel virtue has left me. Now, let's pause right here, right now. Let's make sure we understand this. Jesus already knew all of those things were going to happen. Nothing caught Jesus off guard. Nothing caught Jesus by surprise. Jesus knew that day he was headed to Jairus' house. Jesus knew that day this woman would be in the crowd. Jesus knew that day that woman would reach out in faith. Jesus knew that day that when, he, uh, when she did, virtue would leave his body. And Jesus knew that day that what's getting ready to happen has already been planned and nothing is a surprise. This morning as you come to this place, you may be like this woman. You've expended all your wealth, all your, uh, all your resources, everything that you have, and you're sitting here this morning and in your heart, you're broken, you're, you're just literally at wit's end, and you're looking to reach out to Jesus. I want you to know Jesus already knows you're going to be here. You're not here by mistake. Jesus didn't let things unfold just accidentally. Jesus had a plan. Jesus went this way for a purpose. Jairus' daughter, by the way, if you go ahead and read on, you'll find that Jesus daughter, or Jairus' daughter is just fine, right? This was all to get this man in the place that when Jesus was walking by, that this woman would reach out and touch the garment. And that's exactly how it played out. So this morning, if you think you've come to this place and God's speaking to you and you hear that whisper and you feel that sense within your heart this morning, I want you to know Jesus knew you needed this long before you did. Jesus knew that you needed to be here long before you even got here. And Jesus said, I'm going to be here at Child's Memorial Baptist Church this morning and I'm just going to start walking by. And yes, I know there's a crowd. Yes, I know there's people. Yes, I know there's distractions. But if you have faith this morning to reach out and touch Jesus, Jesus says, not only will I stop, not only will you be healed of whatever it is you're dealing with, not only will He answer your call and your prayer, but Jesus is going to respond this way. I want to have just a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time just with you. That's what's waiting for you this morning. That's what Jesus is saying to you and to me this morning, is if you will just in faith reach out to Him, He is willing in faith to have a one-on-one -on -one with just you. 
But to continue on with how it plays out. The woman looks around and realizes there's no getting out of this. Jesus isn't going until she comes forward and confesses. And so lo and behold, she comes up and she says, yeah, it was me. And she tells the story. I've been dealing with this for 12 years and and I've spent everything that I've had and, and literally you're the only person that I believe can do anything. Every doctor that I've gone to, every sorcerer that I've gone to, every witch doctor I've gone to, I've gone to them all. None of them can heal me. Jesus, you're my last hope. So I reached out and touched your garment, and lo and behold, you healed me. I didn't really want you to stop. I didn't really want to distract you. I didn't want to take you away from what you were doing. But Jesus, you were my only hope. And so I reached out and I touched you. And Jesus said, that's okay. Honey, have peace. That's okay. I'm glad you touched me. That's okay. I'm glad in your faith you have been made whole. I'm glad you stopped me. So if you think Jesus is too busy in whatever it is you think Jesus is doing, I want you to know Jesus is not too busy to stop and have that one-on-one with you this morning. He's not that busy. Is he busy doing things? Yeah, in fact, I'll be honest with you. I think he's probably keeping peace on this earth for heaven's sake. We turn around every day trying to have a war every day. And yet Jesus has his hand of control over all these things. But he's not too busy with that to stop this morning and have one-on-one with you. That's the love that we have of the Father. That is the power of Jesus Christ. That is the ability for Him to do all things. And we should never, ever, ever underestimate what it is that Jesus wants to do in our lives. Now, I want to stop for just a moment, and and I ran through that quickly, but I skipped over something, and I did it on purpose to come back to it right now. How old was the daughter? Twelve years old. How long has this woman been dealing with this problem? For twelve years. For 12 years, 12 years, this woman has spent everything that she's had, doing everything that she knew to try and get well. For 12 years, this man has raised this daughter. It is his only love, his only daughter, his only, uh, all about him, right? I mean, you, you can just imagine how that's playing out. And so here this man has all of his hopes and dreams wrapped up in a 12-year-old girl. And here this woman has all of her hopes wrapped up in Jesus that he can stop the anguish that's been going on for 12 years. You came in this morning, you may have come in much different than maybe your neighbor, but you both have the same need. You came in maybe with a need of of really having Jesus answer a prayer, or you may have come in with a celebration of what Jesus is doing in your life, and all of a sudden now it may be taken away from you. And and so the, the status of what you're facing is different, no doubt about it. This man had one problem, she had another. What I want you to get from this story this morning is this. Both problems were answered by the hand of God. So, Brother Lucky, while you're sitting there saying, will Jesus answer my problem and my need? As Brother Lucky says, Jesus, would you please just handle the situation in my life? At the same time, I'm sitting here praying and saying, God, will you handle mine too? Do you know what Jesus said? Him, I love Lucky. I'm going to handle his problem. At the same time, he's going to tell Lucky, Lucky, I love Brother Tim. I'm going to handle his problem. And if the two of you will agree in spirit, if the two of you will get your mind right and get it set, what I'm going to do for Lucky and what I'm going to do for you, or reverse it uh, around as he's talking to Lucky, Lucky, what I'm going to do for Brother Tim and what I'm going to do for you, if you both are in agreement that I'm the guy that has done this, hold on because I'm getting ready to do the supernatural in everybody's life here this morning. You say, Tim, do you really believe that? I absolutely do. There's no way on earth that God's not going to answer Lucky's problem and then not answer mine. And there's no way God's going to handle my problem and not handle Lucky's. See, he loves us both. And he wants to see us both be successful. But even more than that, he's not answering my prayer and Lucky's prayer just for mine and Lucky's benefit. He's doing it for the church as a whole. And this morning, I want you to know, just as this woman reached out and touched the garment, and just as everything had taken place and she was healed immediately, and just as Jesus met her need, Jesus didn't let it stop there. And if you were here Wednesday night, you know what I'm getting ready to say. We are not called 
to revival but uh, without doing the work of revival. Meaning, if, if we're going to go and we're going to ask God for revival, God's going to give us a responsibility to go and seek that revival. God's not just going to give me revival and say, okay, Tim, here's your revival, because if he does that, I don't learn anything. But when I get to a point where I sit there and I realize, as this woman realized, or as I realize, as Darius realized, that I have a need, and in this church, we need to come to the grips of realizing that we have a need, that that need is that we need to get back to where we were, that we need to be revived, and that we need to go forward, that we need to move forward to, to reach other people. Here's the thing. When Jesus healed this woman, this woman then had to sit there and openly confess it was Jesus that did it. And this morning, I want you to know that as you come into this place, that Jesus, while he's waiting to do whatever it is that, that you need done in your life, as he's waiting to unfurl his plan in your life, as he's waiting to reveal and for you to receive whatever it is that he's got for you this morning, I'm here to tell you when we choose to be obedient and when Jesus says, who touched me this morning, when Jesus says, who in faith reached out to me this morning, when we are bold enough to proclaim that, when we're bold enough to share that, when we're bold enough to stand up with holy courage and announce that, that is when God unfolds within the church. And this morning, he's longing to do that right here in Child's Memorial Baptist Church. So I'm going to go back to something I asked several months ago. Several months ago, back in November, I asked this question. Do you believe God wants this church to have revival? That's what I asked. Do you believe that God wants His church to have revival? And since that time, we have been having lesson after lesson, Bible study after Bible study, sermon after sermon, getting our hearts prepared, talking to us and speaking to us, all the way through from November till now, saying these are the things that we have to start doing if we want to see revival. And we started with the question, do you think God wants us to have revival? And the answer is absolutely yes. I'm going to tell you why I know that. It's found, as you continue to read the story, about Darius and his daughter. You see, as this all plays out, this little girl is pretty much pronounced dead. Jesus could have stopped right where he was at and said, well, we've had one miracle. It's great that we had that miracle. We'll focus on that. We'll move for that. We'll keep going with that. But Jesus said, that's not the work that I've come to do. The work that I've come to do is to give life. The work that I've come to give is to give life and to give it more abundantly. And so this morning, Child's Memorial Baptist Church, we need to understand that God doesn't want us to stay dead. God doesn't want us to stay dead spiritually, and God certainly doesn't want us to stay dead in our works. God wants us to be alive. And so this morning, he's not done with just me or with Lucky. That's the beginning. That's the, that's the sort of appetizer of the menu, if you would. That, that's great that Lucky gets that. That's great that I get that. That's great that Tony gets that. And you can go around the room, each person, and every single person in this room is going to have that dose of a little bit of Jesus if we go in faith to him this morning. But I'm going to tell you, it's when we all come together and we start sharing those stories and we start sharing that message that it's Jesus that has done all of this. That's when your church comes back to life. I'm going to end with this. Going back to the song that Brother David sang. Certainly it's a song that you could use at a, as a funeral. And, and Brother David, I appreciate you sharing it this morning. Because I want you to understand this morning, that song could be sung about you sometime this week. Well, that sounds rude, doesn't it? You see, that song could be about you because tonight, you may, or this afternoon, you may leave here and you may take your last breath and then we'll be singing that song at your funeral about how that we we're thankful that God has taken care of your scars and that you've now entered into the kingdom of God if you're here this morning and you're saved. And so that song may be about you later on this week. But I'm here to tell you something. It began with the question, if I'd only known... Right? 
if I would have just known, if I would have known that brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so needed this or needed that, I would put off everything else to get to that one person to give them what they need. And no doubt this morning that would be true all across this church. If I knew for a fact that Matt needed something and it was, uh, it was something that literally this would be the last time I could ever do it to tell Matt, Matt, I love you, to tell Matt, Matt, I care about you, to tell Matt, Matt, I'm proud of you, I would, I would move heaven and earth to make sure that Matt knew that, right? So this morning I'm going to ask you this. If it's that important that I would do that, how, how much more important is it this morning that I would literally stop everything in my life to get back to where Jesus Christ wants me to be? That I would literally confess my sins, that I would present myself to Him, that I would be obedient in anything He told me to do, and that if necessary, I would stand up and boldly share what Jesus had done in my life that every single person in this room might hear. If this is my last day on earth, if this is the last time you want to hear it, I want you to know my Jesus is sufficient to meet all my needs, including my need for salvation this morning. And I'd be bold. I'd be bold. I wouldn't let Johnny leave here without hearing me share that. I wouldn't let Miss Lisa leave here this morning without hearing that. I wouldn't let Brother David leave here this morning without saying, Hey, Brother David, we need to sing another song. I would make sure that every person in this room heard me say, Jesus is the answer to every single problem that you have in your life. So this morning, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to ask if you would to come back and just begin to play something. And I'm going to ask everybody else to stand and we're going to have this time of invitation and here's what you've got to answer for yourself. God, what do you want me to do today? Let's go back to how we first began. God, what is it that I have to do today? I promised I'd be obedient this morning. I promised I would listen. I'd be receptive. If, if I'm here this morning and, and you need me to say something, I'm going to do it. If I'm here this morning and I have a need, God, I'm going to look to you for the answer. God, I'm going to be like this woman. I'm going to exercise my faith in you. And so here's the question today. What is God asking you to do this morning during this invitation. If God's told you you need to come and pray for somebody, you need to hit the altar. If God's telling you you need to confess your sins to Him, you need to come to the altar. If God's telling you you just need to get alone and say, God, I don't know what the future holds, but whatever it is, I'm going to be obedient to you, you need to hit the altar. Whatever God's speaking to you about this morning, I'm going to tell you, your answer is found right here at the altar, and I pray that you'll come and receive peace in your life knowing that you did what God wanted you to do this morning. You see, when we do what this woman did, Jesus is going to say, oh, don't be a fear, be a faith, because it's your faith that has made you whole. Have peace. Have peace. Let's stand together with heads bowed and with eyes closed. And even right now as she plays, if God's speaking to you, you step out and you come right now. Father, I pray that you might have your way today. Oh God, that you might just touch each and every person, each and every heart. For those that are watching by video, for those that are here in person. God, whatever it is, may you just reveal yourself to each and every one of us. That we might know that not only is the power of your healing available. But Father, the power of your peace is, is just phenomenal. And it's waiting for me if I'll just be obedient to you. Bless us now as, as we come to this time of invitation. Bless each person for it's in your holy and precious name we pray. And with heads bowed and with eyes closed as these have come, if God's speaking to you, you come right now.
I'm so glad you were here this morning. Now, I'm not going to do what I normally do and have somebody pray real quick. Brother Steve, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit different this morning. I said, if there's anything that God wanted you to do this morning, I'm going to give you the chance to do it, and I meant that. If someone has something that God has laid on their heart to share, I want you to have the ample opportunity to do it. Now, Brother Johnny, I'm just going to be honest with you. God may not have anybody but me just, just all pumped and excited, but I don't want to let anybody leave here this morning without giving them the opportunity. If God's laid something on your heart, would you share it with our church this morning? All throughout the house. You're in agreement with Lisa, raise your hand. Amen. Anyone else? It's just now 12 o'clock. You've got plenty of time if you want to share. Anyone at all? Seeing none, I'm going to ask, Brother Tony, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer? And as you pray and dismiss, would you just ask that God might just dose out a special blessing for every single person that was here this morning, and that until we meet again, that God might just continue to reveal himself to us. Brother Tony.